Welcome at Eindhoven University of Technology. A warm welcome to the second Rylum International Conference on Digital Concrete. It's 12 o'clock here at our place, but I do realize some of you just woke up and grabbed your first cup of tea or coffee, while others already finished and enjoyed, hopefully, their dinner. Wherever you are, I sincerely hope that you and all that you love are still in good shape and haven't suffered too much from the COVID-19 virus over the past time. It's different sitting alone behind your screen instead of meeting together here live. But please realize that you are far from alone. Right now, the virtual main stage is occupied by over 350 participants coming from all over the world. Both scientists and you working in our industry. This is a strong signal of a vital community a community that is still expanding rapidly since the wonderful conference two years ago at ATH Zurich. My name is Theo Schlett, and I'm the leader of the research group Structural Design of Concrete Structures at Eindhoven University of Technology, shortly TUE. Besides, I'm also the dean of our department of the built environment, and I welcome you on behalf of the full university to our virtual campus. We are proud to host this year's conference from the city of Eindhoven, a city that is known from its high-tech manufacturing industry. Think about ASML producing high-quality chips and Philips that started here some hundred years ago to make consumer goods producing light bulbs some hundred years ago. Most of the old buildings of Philips are not occupied anymore nowadays, but they are occupied by new people, by artists, making our cities a mixture of high-tech technology, entrepreneurship, and design. Many of you here present today prepared 111 presentations and papers, and it is you that are the stars of this conference. We, as an organization committee, connected the pieces together. We hope that the conference will be informative and provide all of us the opportunity to learn. We also hope, and would like to emphasize this, that this conference becomes a place to meet your peers and friends again after some time and strengthen our young community again. Having said this, I invite my colleague Fred Bos, sharing this conference, to take over from me and give you more details on the upcoming conference. Thank you very much, Theo, for your opening words. My name is Fred Bos. I'm the chairman of the organization committee of Digital Concrete 2020. Welcome, everybody, from around the world. And we have an amazing program lined up for you in the coming four days. We have five keynote speakers and 10 invited talks from world-renowned experts. We have more than 100 parallel presentations covering everything from rheology and mixture design to structural engineering, life cycle analysis and projects 
really everything that has to do with the digital fabrication of concrete. And we have something else. Uh, we are also taking you on a virtual tour along the Dutch 3D concrete printing industry in five science meets industry videos. But conferences are not only about listening, uh, Theo already mentioned it. It's about communicating, it's about networking, it's about discussing. Um, and that goes for an on-location conference, but it goes for an uh, online conference such as this one just as well. So we are offering um, all possibilities to make that happen. So we have Q&A sessions with presenters, we have breakout rooms where you can have discussions with your peers, but you can also meet one-on-one -on -one through the online platform. Um, a conference like this obviously doesn't solidify just out of thin air. So now you see Theo and me in front of the camera, but we have an amazing team working behind the camera to make this possible. And you will meet them in the coming days and in the closing sessions at the various locations of this conference. But I already say a very big thank you for making this possible. A big note also goes to our sponsors. Um, we have Weber BMX, Sika, Twente Additive Manufacturing, Bekar, BASF and Dow. And it is very obvious that without their support, a conference like this would not be possible. So thank you very much. And I urge all of you in the audience to have a look to see what our sponsors can do for your 3D concrete plan printing plans. Now, uh, with that, I would like to move on to our first guest. Um, Digital Concrete is a RILAM conference. Uh, it was initiated by the RILAM Technical Committee 276 digital fabrication with cement-based materials. And now joining us on the line is Dr. Nicolas Roussel, who is the head of research at IFSTAR in Paris, but also the chairman of this technical committee, as well as vice chair of RILAM. So Nicolas, do we have you on the line? And how are you doing? Yes, I'm connected. Can you hear me correctly? Yes, I can. And how are you doing? Very good. So uh, I'm doing perfectly fine. Uh, so first I'm going to say hello to my friends who just woke up uh, in the east part of the world compared to me, uh, west part, and to my friends who are about to go to bed and I thank everyone to be connected. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And first, I guess I will speak uh, in the name of Rylam with my hat of uh, vice president of the association uh, to remind everyone that most conferences have been canceled this year or have been reported at the best. But this one is an exception because of the very hard work and the energy, sense of innovation of the organizing team in Eindhoven. We are very happy to be online today to be able to exchange our ideas and discuss. So big thanks for this effort and I'm really looking forward to the coming date. So I freak just said this conference is a Rylam conference and there are a few, I would say, historical rules with uh, Rylam conference. So first, the scientific committee of such a conference is made of all the RILAM members of the corresponding technical committee. So I would like to thank them because they contributed a lot to the reviewing process and they were at the backbone of our scientific committee. Um, I'm very happy to see so many people connected and I'm very happy to see the very wide uh, geographical coverage of this conference uh, as long uh, as, as well as the scientific coverage of all the topics. So for your information, uh, through the conference, uh, some members of the award jury will be connected to some sessions, uh, to every session, and we'll be uh, identifying uh, the best presentation uh, to uh, be able to give an award at the end of this conference. So I was very proud to share this committee. Our first task was to select the best papers and the best paper awards along with the best presentation awards will be given at the closing session of this conference. So don't miss this uh, moment that will be very important. So everyone, I wish you a very nice conference. I will be watching all these and contributing myself uh, from my swimming pool uh, in my holiday house in the south. So I hope you are all as comfortable as I am. And um, I wish you a nice conference. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Nicolas. Um, before you leave, I was wondering, uh, is there some, maybe something you'd like to say about the upcoming state of the art report that our committee is uh, preparing? Yes. 
so the, the aim or the goal of uh, any uh, RILEM technical committee is to produce a state-of-the-art report on the topic of interest. So in our case, that would be digital manufacturing with concrete or cement-based materials. And we are doing our best to have this report ready before the end of the year. Many of the chapters are already finished. There are a few things to uh, finalize. But before the end of the year, uh, this state-of-the-art report will be available. But bear in mind that some of the results of these, uh, this state-of-the-art report will be presented in this conference under uh, the form of some uh, invited lectures. And you can find some of the outcome of this collective work that started in 2016 in the special issue of cement and concrete research that is associated to this conference. Well, thank you very much, Nicolas, and thank you for uh, your opening words on behalf of RILAM. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you around at other places in the conference. But uh, first, you can go and enjoy your swimming pool if you want. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and um, myself, I can say I'm really looking forward to this publication of the State of the Art Report. I'm sure that it will be the comprehensive reference for anybody who was looking for a thorough uh, introduction into the field. So keep an eye out for that one. Not. I have to say, not that our audience will be deprived of uh, things to read. Um, actually, um, if you don't know how to spend your summer holiday or the long winter evenings, if you're joining from the Southern Hemisphere, then we will have more than enough material for you. For starters, there's the proceedings with 111 papers or close to 1,200 pages. Um, due to some technical issues, it is almost uh, online, it will be there in a couple of uh, in a couple of hours, available for download uh, for you from the reception area. Um, but besides the proceedings, we also have 12 um, uh, presentation posters, some of them with an audio tape as well, uh, as an explanation. Um, and then, as um, Nicolas already mentioned, um, we have teamed up again with. Uh, the Elsevier Journal Cement and Concrete Research to make a special issue for digital concrete. There was already one in the, uh, associated with the first um, digital concrete conference two years ago. Uh, and building on that success, uh, we've prepared a new one for Digital Concrete 2020. It contains 13 full-length uh, articles um, by widely, um, uh, widely uh, uh, research, uh, researchers from, from really from groups all around the world. Um, the journal article, is, uh, the articles are also available from our online platform and they will be uh, open access uh, as well as for everybody to download within a couple of days. Uh, besides that, we also bring you a complementary issue of CPT magazine, which is a magazine that uh, uh, approaches the issues more from an industrial angle and is also very uh, worthy of reading. Um, now, I'm aware that for many of you in the audience, this might be your first online conference. And I can tell you, certainly for me, it's my first online conference. And uh, normally, if this would be an on -lo a location conference, I would now be uh, starting to tell you some of the house rules. But in this case, we hardly have any house rules. So you don't need to mute your phone. You can just leave it on. Uh, you don't have to dress up sharp. You can sit there in your pajamas. You can eat and drink during the presentations. You can basically do whatever you like. Um, the only house rule that we have is that we ask you not to leave anything inappropriate in the chat uh, functions that are available in the online conference. So to find your way around the, uh, the conference uh, online, uh, we've made a short YouTube video that was di distributed to all of the registered participants. It will also be accessible from our website. Um, and that gives you a, a, a nice and, and comprehensive explanation of uh, how the system works and where you can find everything. I just like to summarize a couple of things. So the, the online environment consists of uh, four main areas. We have the reception, the stage, the sessions and the expo. Um, and the reception is really conference base camp. So there you can find everything, all the practical links, explanations of how the platform works, but also link to the, to the schedule and the program. 
uh, links to the uh, to the proceedings and a CCR special issue to the posters. And what is probably important to mention is that you can also watch all the presentations from the reception area. The links are there. So all the presentations have been pre-recorded. So if you are joining from another time zone, um, you can um, uh, watch these videos at your own convenience. Then we have the stage. So, so the stage button leaves, leads to the conference main stage. So that is actually where we are right now. Um, and this is where all the, uh, in, uh, all the keynote uh, speaks will take place, the closing sessions, the Science Meets Industry videos, and at the end of each day, Monday to Wednesday, we'll have here a little wrap-up session. And what is a wrap-up session? We're having one of our PhD students here on the stage moderating with four members of the scientific uh, committee that are also in the award jury. And those four members will have been following each of the parallel room presentations for the whole day. And they will give in uh, 10 to 15 minutes a little bit of their impressions of the day. Um, then um, we have this so-called sessions area. Well, the sessions area is a slightly misleading name. Uh, it is not where you find all the uh, parallel presentations. In the sessions area, you will find the so-called breakout uh, sessions where you can have discussions with your peers. How does it work? You can just go there. It's free. It's not moderated and see who else is there. And, uh, and join basically on the discussion that, that you like. Uh, we have four of these breakout uh, sessions divided by topic. And finally, we have the expo area. And expo area is really the core of the conference. Uh, you will find the virtual booths there of our platinum and gold sponsors. Again, please have a look and uh, see what they can mean for you. Um, and besides that, we are also having the access to the four uh, virtual rooms where the presentations take place. So if you want to go to the normal parallel presentations, go to the expo. That is where you will find it. Um, OK, so that's a lot of introductory talk uh, from Theo and from myself. Uh, I think it's time to get started on the real stuff, so the stuff that you're all here for. Uh, so we get started with our first keynote lecture. Uh, on the line, I will have Professor Robert Flett and Dr. Lex Reiter from the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. Professor Flett is a professor of physical chemistry of building materials at the ETH since 2010, and he is also the editor-in-chief of Cement and Concrete Research. Uh, over the last years, he has uh, performed uh, inf important research work on the set on demand of concrete, which is really uh, a pillar for the development of digital concrete. Um, Dr. Uh, Lex Reiter is a postdoc, also in the group of Dr. Flat, uh, of Professor Flat, sorry, and um, he also works in the area of early strength uh, development of concrete, and he's also uh, the first author of the associated uh, paper that is in the CCR special issue. Um, I'll be discussing with them. If you have any questions that you would like to ask to these keynote presenters, you can put them in the chat area and um, they will be signaled to me, to my ear, and I will post them to the presenters. So with that, um, I'd like to ask Robert, welcome, good to see you. Um, you are uh, joining us from Zurich, uh, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Nice to uh, be here and, and see this uh, kicking off. Thank you. Um, so you've been the host together with uh, Tim Wengler uh, of the first uh, Digital Concrete Conference uh, two years ago. And um, yeah, I was really wa wondering, um, so the f back then um, the field was uh, still relatively small, I think, but it was already developing and growing quite quickly. So. What has happened since the last over the last two years, and how has the field developed? Well, thanks, uh, Freak, um, for the uh, introduction and, and organizing the conference. I will uh, try to tell you a little bit about my perception on how the field has evolved, what what the big questions are that are going to be coming to us, and we'll also try 
to give you a couple insights on our special issue uh, paper. But first of all, and I think in name of all the participants, I would like to thank you and your colleagues at TU Eindhoven really very much for making it possible for this event to take place. I think it's uh, really important for the field and um, thank you again for, for making this possible. Um, before I, I discuss a bit the, the view on, on what the field is, um, is doing, I would like to also underline the important contribution that the proceedings of the conference and the special issue are going to make to the field. And in this regard, I just wanted to highlight that the, among the most downloaded papers over the past 90 days for CCR, four are from the special issue of Digital Concrete 2020. And there's three still remaining from the special issue of Digital Concrete 2018, so that's very good. And another sign of the value of these uh, papers and proceedings in terms of the papers is that six of the special issue papers from 2018 are among the top 10 best cited papers from 2018 for CCR. So um, again, I think the conference is, is really needed and, and valuable for the field. There's one thing that I think we all appreciate a lot is to see how many large scale demonstrators are being materialized or uh, in the process of being materialized in some cases. And I think this is really a new era that we are entering. This also means that the questions we are getting are going to be more precise. We're going to have to give more accurate answers, more serious ones in some cases. And that is something I would like to elaborate a little bit upon in this talk. Congratulations on your introduction video, really nice and cool. And also thank you for allowing us to talk about materials and chemistry, even if you forgot, unfortunately, those two very important keywords in that uh, video. So we try to prepare um, for that. I wanted in this talk to tell you a bit also about what's been going on at ETH in the sense of a plurality of approaches to digital fabrication. And I think this is something that the field is maybe not appreciating enough is how much there is beyond extrusion printing, even if that clearly is an extremely important and valuable process. So highlights on our side have been the opening of the DFAP house. Some of you saw it close to complete at the uh, conference in Zurich. What I would like to underline is that people who visit this and are not informed that it was robotically built all say that there is something special. They feel a sense of comfort. And essentially what this is speaking to is how the colleagues who designed this managed to use digital fabrication to increase the quality of the living environment. And I think this is an achievement that we should focus on achieving in uh, digital fabrication. There are a number of other important large-scale demonstrators, and I would like to point out this one, Nit Candela, realized in Mexico with the different characters here, including Lex, we'll talk later, but a project uh, clearly led by the Block Research Group, and just a word of recognition to the very significant contribution of Matthias Rippmann to the NCCR, uh, Matthias, who unfortunately uh, very tragically left us about a year ago. In this picture, what you see is a knitted formwork stretched in place, and under the careful examination of the project media, Mariana Popescu, getting ready to be sprayed with a fast setting grout developed by Lex, and then stiffening to be able to receive concrete on top of it. Of, I think this is a process that has a lot of potential and one that I hope to see uh, continuing to strive. Other things that we have been working on include digital casting. And Ina Jochet Fritschi later today will give you an overview on this. Many of you may remember the process of smart dynamic casting. And this has evolved towards including something we refer to as eggshell. Jochis Burger will talk about that later today and ACDC, Concrete That Rocks. That will be talked about by Anna Savo on Wednesday. So eggshell, you can imagine the idea is the following. We 3D print a very thin uh, formwork 
and do it in a way that we can include standard reinforcement so we don't have problems structurally. However, in order to place the concrete, we have to, over, we have to prevent the formwork from bursting under the effect of the hydrostatic pressure of concrete. And for this, we use set on demand concrete. Here's the structure which is realized. It's the base of this tree, which is a pavilion combining digital casting with robotic assembly of a timber structure realized by the Granatio Cola Research Group and placed at the entrance of the headquarters of Basler Hoffmann in Switzerland, a leading engineering company in our country. Here is a cool example. This looks like some kind of gremlin kind of structure or, or a, a creature. And it was actually done in a student project with eggshell relatively easily. And I think it points to the ease at fabricating complex structures with this process. Now, of course, you could argue that you have to print, it takes some time, you don't know if you can fully recycle the formwork and various other possible limitations. So the question is, what could we do to make formwork even easier and cheaper? Well, an easy way is just to take some plastic foils from the supermarket, stretch them between supports, and then use setting on demand concrete, as in this video, in order to cast complex shapes with very cheap and easy formwork. So this is ACDC, and it stands for Admixture Controlled Digital Casting. But of course, even cheaper than these plastic foils would be air. And there we go in the direction of extrusion printing, pioneered by Professor Koshnevis. And believe it or not, ETH has also uh, gone into this game uh, under the lead of Professor Dillenburger and his student Anna Anton, who will also talk later today. This is a large scale demonstrator for an arts festival in Switzerland. It was a proof of concept that we were asked to realize to obtain an even larger project, which is now in the works. You will also hear from Dirk Lofke, among others, about the potential of powder bed printing, a technique developed by Enrico Dini, and that is seeing various further ramifications. This again shows us that there is a plurality of processes for digital fabrication of concrete structures. And the question with all these possibilities, what should we really be striving for? Well, I would argue that we want to reduce the impact, the environmental impact of the construction sector. And in this regard, we have to consider that we have a total impact being a product of the amount of material used by the material impact divided by the service life. So clearly with smart design, we can generate structures using less material for the same function. However, we should not overkill that with a material that has a larger environmental footprint. And the conference will have various talks where the question of how to reduce the environmental footprint of the material itself will be discussed. I think there's also important work to be done in terms of the durability of these structures. And it is really the combination of these that will tell us if we will be successful in making a contribution to sustainability through digital fabrication. This is, however, all going to be bound also to the question of cost and is in this regard from my co-chair of the Digital Concrete Conference in 2018, Timothy Wangler. I wanted to show you this graph from his paper of 2019 in CCR. Schematically, what we argue is that for conventional construction, the cost for a given structure increases with complexity, something like that, and that digital fabrication starts at a higher level and has some crossover point beyond which construction becomes more cost effective by digital fabrication. Through research, what we're going to be doing is to reduce the cost level of digital fabrication, make it more efficient, and shift the break-even point to the left. This will increase the range of structures that can be cost-effectively produced. And what this means in terms of sustainability is that we're going to make it more economically um, affordable to produce 
structures using less material. However, for this, there is a large need for research and development. And I think that um, presentations in the conference are going to be really essential in order to achieve this. So, um, Freak, I hope I covered your first question and um, we can maybe continue yeah. the discussion with a couple I think uh, pieces of information. Yeah, I think very extensively. I mean, um, what is absolutely clear is that uh, the field has not been standing still and there has been huge uh, amount of developments. Um, I think it, personally think it's really fascinating to see that uh, yeah, these concepts that were maybe two, three, four years ago were, were really in the lab, so to say, and, and maybe in some experimental structures here and there are now very, very quickly finding their way into the construction practice. Um, but yeah, so you also indicate that we we need a lot of research to uh, shift the, the break even point of where you know, complexity and, and economy meet each other. But I was wondering if you could elaborate maybe a little bit on what kind of research uh, do we need and, um, and how research can help the adaptation of you know, bringing digital fabrication of concrete into practice or into uh, construction reality. So there's, there's many aspects to that, uh, chemistry, materials, process. And I think the best is that I let uh, Lex Heiter uh, take over from here uh, okay. to tell you about uh, part of these aspects. Wonderful. Hi, Lex. Good to um, see you. Good to see you too. And thank you for asking the question. So basically, if we, are to, uh, if we want to move this technology from research uh, to industrial implementation, then it has to become a little bit easier to use and we have to become able to certify the products. So uh, what will uh, decide whether this will be possible or not will to a large extent, of course, be the possibility to integrate uh, reinforcement uh, because this determines whether we can um, build according to building codes um, and Manner and co-authors are going to give a presentation towards this goal later today. And Lee and co-authors will present on ECCs that are possible technological solution to this. From ETH, there is also a presentation by Lucas Gephardt uh, on using interlayer fibers and post-tensioning on beams. Uh, from the material side, however, what we should be most concerned about is a means to uh, guarantee quality. So our printing needs to work reliably um, and give the same results. Um, as seen here from the left at about the time of the last conference, um, where the printing was working a few times uh, out of many trials, uh, over to something that works robustly. For this to work, um, we need to, um, uh, to have the printing properties not change during the printing process, but they should also not change between working days or when batches of material change. They should also not change when the temperature changes and when the season changes. Mm -hmm. And the, it, the material should be robust to some small uh, dosing variations. For example, the water content being slightly wrong. Um, so material robustness here is really key, especially for the two main printing parameters. And these are the static yield stress at the time of deposition, making sure that the material doesn't uh, stays in place, and then as we are building higher, the yield stress should increase over time. So structuration rate is important so that um, the strength buildup um, outperforms the, the loading that we apply. Uh, and we have to then uh, make sure to not have plastic collapse and elastic buckling. And this gives us basically a characteristic to be fulfilled by the material that looks like this. So, and um, as we know now what we need, uh, we of course need to be able to measure this so that we can fulfill it later. And at, for this goal, uh, penetration tests have shown to be very useful um, already before. So Mettler and co-authors have shown that penetration and compressive strength uh, scale excellently uh, for mortars. 
and Lutens and co-authors have shown that um, in PACE, uh, there is an exponential increase of the penetration force um, over time. Um, while, uh, while that scaling uh, the same way uh, independently of the penetration kit that is used. Uh, so these papers are already very nice, but they are a bit limited in the sense that they don't allow us to make a clear statement about the validity ranges, and they are limited to specific mixed compositions. So we are revisiting uh, this and looking at a penetration test that looks like the following where we record the force as the tip moves into the sample. We can first do that at a fast speed, um, and we observe here in this log-log plot that um, as the penetration tip introduces into the sample, the force does not increase dramatically, whereas if we are measuring it on the same, doing the same measurement on older samples, then we see an exponential increase of the force over time. Doing the exact same measurement, but much, much slower, we can now uh, do continuous measurements. So uh, here again, we see this exponential increase uh, of the force over time. And this is something that is rather accurately repeatable. So our measurement uh, follows the same trend in both cases. And when we compare it to other measuring methods, um, such as uh, vein and compressive strength, we see exactly the same trend, so an exponential increase over time. Um, and uh, both times in their respective ranges, of course. And a linear um, relationship between that and the penetration force. And now what we can contribute on top of that is to uh, use a geomechanical analogy to calculate the yield stress based on the slow penetration uh, test. Uh, and what we see is an excellent agreement between the slow penetration and all the other methods without us needing any fitting parameter. So the way that works is that we uh, make an analogy with a foundation in soil and we get a physical model uh, that looks like this with an equation directly linking the force that we are measuring to the yield stress. Um, and there being a prefactor uh, that comes from literature in geomechanics. Um, the nice approach in this is that now we have a verification from the analytics that we are quantifying the yield stress. And we need no experimental fitting because literature tells us that uh, for fresh place and for mortars, this value is approximately nine. And with the, um, with the framework of this model, we can define limits of validity for this method. So we get a certain range of yield stresses that we can cover. Just to demonstrate that this works on mortars, um, I show you here uh, the force of penetration for different mortars. Uh, we compare that then directly to uniaxial compression tests and we get the same type of master curve, even though uh, the uncertainty range at this time is a little bit larger. Okay, so now this is enough on measurements. We have that in place and we can somewhat trust the measurement. So now the next step is to understand how to use it. So for that, I first want to introduce how um, strength buildup in these materials should work. So we first have a physical uh, process of loculation that builds a network of interacting particles that gives this structural buildup that we are desiring. Now, as hydration occurs, uh, this in, um, the hydration products are contributing to the amplification of that network, and we get an increase of the storage modulus or of our shear uh, modulus. Um, taking now these measurements after long uh, after 20 minutes uh, we can compare them uh, more directly to uh, the heat rate uh, from the hydration process and if we do that um, comparing immediately uh, directly the structuration rate with the heat rate we get this nice linear relationship and what this is telling us is that if we are if we want to have a certain structuration rate first we need 
a quite high amount of hydration to take place. And we need this to uh, happen in a controlled way. And the way that we are devising is then to use an accelerator to achieve this. Taking all of that uh, and applying it to the layered extrusion process, uh, we can see how this will uh, work all as a framework. So we first want, we want to now build a hollow cylinder and we have the requirement that um, we need a certain uh, yield stress evolution over time at the very minimum. Then we can tailor the strength buildup of our motor using different quantities of accelerator. And we can verify with the penetration test that this uh, strength buildup keeps staying the same throughout the process. Now we um, take this method and we apply it directly to a case. So here you see a graph where we have the measured yield stress directly compared to the needed one. So this basically tells us that the uh, cylinder should um, stay stable. And indeed it, indeed it does so for the first about 30 centimeters, but eventually the layer settlement is so high that the printer prints in the air and it fades. If we now only slightly increase the radius of the cylinder, so decreasing the vertical speed very slightly, um, we have a bit of a larger gap between measured and needed yield stress, and this is then good enough to print. So the solution basically is to introduce a safety factor that captures these large deformations. Um, now we can uh, take um, the same approach and look at different geometries. So on the x-axis, our cylinder diameter changes, and we uh, use um, different quantities of accelerator. And we can then, for every single of these measurements, compare the measured yield stress to the one that is needed. And we get this graph. Uh, what it shows is that we should not only be concerned about the immediate failures uh, in this red zone, but we should also see um, failures uh, due to layer settlement. Uh, whereas if we are above this threshold, uh, the, the structure stays stable. So we have our uh, safety factor basically experimentally determined as being this 2.1 in our case. Now we can have a look where this is coming from and we turn to other measurement methods. So when we observe the yield stress, for example, by vein, we see it where you can see the arrow. However, at this point, a lot of the material stiffness has already deteriorated. So the material becomes softer um, at the point uh, where um, the yield stress is observed. And the same is true, for example, in shear oscillation measurements, having the yield stress here, whereas the storage modulus has already decreased substantially at that point. And in uniaxial compression tests, we see also the same thing, uh, where we see the yield stress at the error and a strong decrease of stiffness. So um, taking that into account, we probably have to think about um, creep as a phenomenon to account for. Um, and we get a range uh, in which we can expect the safety factor to be. And based on these other measurement methods, we expect to be in the range of two to three. So this is consistent with, with what I showed before. Now, the big, one of the big questions is if this affects also the buckling behavior. And our colleagues uh, in Eindhoven especially have shown that um, the buckling is definitely a failure mode that exists. They can very uh, nicely approximate the shape of failure. And it also works to take into account geometric stiffening of the material. Um, however, um, maybe there is a little bit more to it. So the other thing that works very well is that the, we can plot the needed yield stress over time and the measurements done by the, our colleagues. And it seems like there is no failure to be expected. However, if we consider the dangerous zone for these large deformations, then we do get an intersection. And indeed, the start of buckling seems to occur uh, somewhere in this region. So maybe we should consider 
on top of the buckling analysis to consider some effect of creep. Um, and uh, with that, I uh, yield back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Lex. Um, um, I think this um, this whole new issue that you've been discussing in quite a bit of length on, on the buildability and what the material parameters, how they develop over time and how they influence the possibility of failures during printing is uh, extremely important and relevant. And uh, you, s you see it back in, in a lot of publications. So it's it seems to be an issue that is still very much under academic debate on how to measure and what the criteria for, fa for failure r really are. Um, and um, one of the things I'm, I'm particularly interested in is the continuous measurement development uh, 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 method that you were showing uh, because it is so important to track the real uh, development of the material over time, not just on know uh, fixed time intervals but really continuously so I think it's a very promising uh, development um, of course the question um, then comes this 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 time de dependent development of, of strength and stiffness of the material uh, is there any way that we can control it so how what tools do we have available to um, master that, or are we just slaves to the development of the cement? Uh, so this is basically where chemistry comes into play, uh, and as Robert is really the specialist on hydration, I would uh, like him to uh, present uh, that part of the work. So hello again, everybody. Hi. Welcome back. Transition. Um, so. Uh, chemistry can help a lot, but it can't do anything. And I think it's important to frame the needs and the targets first. So in this sense, uh, key questions to look at first are what building rate will we be targeting? And this depends, of course, on the contour length, on the print head speed, and on the layer thickness. But also, what is going to be the initial rheology? Are we going to be going for something like self-compacting, as in ACDC? or SDC, or are we going to want something self-sustaining as in contour crafting or extrusion printing? But importantly also, how is, the concrete going to pre how is the concrete going to be prepared upstream? Will it be by large batches that then have to be rather substantially retarded? Or will the con concrete be continuously produced whereby some degree of retardation will be needed, but not that, that much? Whatever the situation is, however, I think the approach of setting on demand or awakening of concrete can come into play, and that's where chemistry uh, steps in. Now, to make this um, simple and accessible, so to say, or just to present the key concept first, um, let's imagine a group of cement particles that want to have a party, and they might look like this representation. So they're uh, ready to do something. And what you would like is to slow them down, to put them to sleep. And there we can use a chemical admixture, in this case, maybe tequila or something else. And you get the first part of the, of the job done. You put them to sleep. After a certain time, what you would like is for these particles to get active again. And there you might want to boost them with some other kind of chemical admixture mixture to get the party started, to get the strength development of your placed material going. Now, this very general concept is applicable to many different processing forms of digital fabrication. And we've done it for digital casting, layered extrusion, spraying, or application of coatings. Schematically, you have a batch of concrete, which is retarded with one act with one admixture, you're pumping it. And at some point, you mix this with an activator. Now, typically, the mixing chamber is going to be rather close to the extrusion, because you, or to the nozzle, better said, because you don't want this to set in your delivery channels. And actually, if we look at existing literature or some of the patents shown on this paper, basically, 
that is one of the aspects of um, the descriptions of the embodiments presented. Now, a bit more specifically, how can we actually do this? Well, in his PhD, Lex has developed the use of ternary binders and Arnish Dust is following up on this. And the idea is to move away from a pure OPC system towards something that will include calcium aluminate cements, but preferably also some calcium sulfate sources. What we do with this is that we allow the system to quite rapidly precipitate secondary phases. And if we look at the overall scheme of cement hydration, as shown here, what we have by adding a calcium aluminate cement is that we enhance the precipitation of etrangite in the early stages. This has various consequences. First, it creates solid volume, which is beneficial for the strength gain, but also it changes the kinetics of hydration. Now, you may notice in the center of the figure that the main hydration peak is somewhat changed, but more importantly, in the very first periods, we see an increase in the rate of heat release, which indicates that hydration is processing at a higher rate. And this is one of the keys to the process. Now, calcium aluminate cements would have to be used as pastes. This is possible, we do it but you may also be interested in using solutions. And for this, we can turn to shotcrete as an inspiration. Very schematically, the alkali-free accelerators that are used a lot in the field include aluminum sulfate, aluminum hydroxide, which is solubilized by the addition of an acid. However, the level of performance that these accelerators deliver is not necessarily what you want, it's too high than what you want for most digital uh, fabrication processes. So one solution, and that is what's used in ACDC, is to go to something containing just aluminum sulfate, but to try and control the slightly excessive initial impact on rheology by adding some superplasticizer. So you can see that these are compounds that exist. It's um, requiring to have the knowledge of methodology to then calibrate the formulation of your product and the penetrometer test that uh, Lex Heiter has presented does allow to do this and has made it possible for us to achieve it. So those are a couple guidelines on how chemistry can be used for this. I hope, Freak, that this uh, answers a bit, at least, of your question. I think, thank you, uh, Robert. I think it certainly does. It um, seems to me, actually, that, uh, let's say, chemically speaking, we have the tools available uh, to to make the material do what what we want it to do. So then the question is, how would you see this uh, field moving forward? Well, I'm not sure. I think there's various possibilities, and they're not necessarily self-exclusive. I think um, one important question is, are we going to be going towards on-site or prefabrication? For those of you interested in looking at challenges and opportunities for in-situ digital fabrication, I would just point you to this article uh, from the previous conference. This is a um, market question, but there's others. Are we going to be trying to replace unreinforced masonry, as some people claim, or rather going to replace reinforced concrete. What kind of applications? Are we going for high-end ones, but lower volume, or rather ordinary ones and large volume? What about the reliability? How will we guarantee structural integrity? And who will sign off? How do we do this, not just on a very specific case-by-case -case basis for specific demonstrators, but much more generally? I think this um, has a number of questions that need to be answered, and they're very importantly the work uh, that you colleagues have really, I think, pioneered in structural considerations of digital concrete uh, are really playing an important role. I think the question of sustainability has to be addressed seriously. What is the appropriate benchmark? <clears throat> what is the durability of the structures that are being produced? And what is ultimately the real environmental footprint. In terms of cost, 
ultimately considering all aspects where will the cost benefit really come from and how will the market react the market is not static it evolves continuously slowly but continuously and over time these are major changes other technologies as augmented reality can come in and make it much easier for traditional techniques to compete with digital or robotic fabrication however i think as i tell my students that we should think different and build different but we should build safe durable eco-friendly and cheap or cheap enough and this implies that many different disciplines should come together to answer the questions that they can best answer in order to symbolize this need for interdisciplinarity or call it diversity i borrowed this uh, picture from a cultural diversity day organized by unesco and made a couple minor adjustments to represent the plurality of fields involved in digital fabrication with concrete and i hope that the dialogue will continue that this conference will really promote dialogue exchange and mutual understanding so this brings me to my conclusions i think a lot has happened and that a new phase has begun it's exciting but it also brings along much more critical questions competitiveness scalability reliability durability and environmental impact i believe that the hand waving arguments that sometimes are given in introductory uh, statements will no more be good enough that claims of good intention neither will be good enough will be good enough we will need to back up these claims with serious data and serious studies so i think this is what is awaiting for us among the different challenges uh, is to have the processes working reliably and there i'm absolutely convinced that adequate measurement techniques are essential i hope that lex could show you what is possible with the penetrometer type of tests and how you can analyze the structures at early age in this regard and also we hope to have somewhat demystified a little bit the chemical options for set on demand with this i would like to thank all the colleagues at the nccr national center for competence of research in digital fabrication in switzerland for their passionate contributions and enthusiasm I would also like to thank the Swiss National Science Foundation for its massive financial support to this competence center. I would very much, again, in the name of all participants, like to thank the colleagues organizing this event in Eindhoven and thank all the participants for their kind attention, wishing them a very successful and productive conference. Well, thanks very much, Robert and Lex, uh, for our first keynote. Um, we have a couple of questions from the floor, let's say the digital floor, which I'd like to pose to you. Um, uh, first, uh, Wilson da Silva uh, asks uh, if you could elaborate on on the complexity of the some of the structures that you were showing in the uh, when you were presenting some of the uh, the, the case studies and examples. Um, from a from a structural design perspective so um, um it seems that so th there indeed there seems to be a greater number of large-scale applications on the horizon but to which extent will producing unique elements that are really you know, spectacular how will they will they hinder the widespread application of these new technologies so there might be that there might be some competition between um doing the very fancy and very complicated because the new technologies allow us to do things that w were not possible before or is it or or the 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 other direction could be um developing these technologies into something that can be really mainstream uh, be used in a lot of cases and and really compete with existing manufacturing processes Okay, so um, I will, before I start answering uh, at least part of the question, I, I just wanted to call Lex up also so that he can contribute to giving um, answers from his perspective. 
And um, I think as an example of where complexity is beneficial is topologically optimized structures. Uh, there's an example from the group of Professor Dillenburger at ETH where they produced a concrete slab which reduces by, if my memory is correct, 60 to 70% the amount of concrete used to produce that slab. So that is where complexity is serving a purpose of reducing the amount of material used. I think there's also simpler examples. You think about uh, compression uh, structures or, or vaults, uh, arches, they are very much uh, to be designed on a case-by-case -case basis. And even if the requirements are relatively simple, they are not consistent with, the, with many of the existing approaches for uh, standard formwork. So I think there's um, um, a very wide range of spectrum of what we define as complexity. And in this sense, <clears throat> as shown in the graph, there are some ultra complex things that one could produce, but they're a, a low volume of the market. And however, you know, the, the closer you go to the most basic things, the more difficult I think the competitiveness will be. But uh, Lex mm -hmm. certainly has some other points um, to add there. Wilson was also alluding correctly to the question of one-off structures. And um, I would agree that that is a difficult subject because we cannot on one-off uh, structures do an approval by testing approach every time. So I think the structural engineers will eventually uh, be very challenged in defining building codes that take into account the 3D printing uh, process and the reinforcement strategies that are possible for it. And uh, that will probably define if these one-off structures can be built in an efficient way or not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we also have a couple of questions on the penetrometer test. Um, Ms. Irina Ivanova asks uh, to you, Alex, uh, uh, how do we obtain separate curves for without hydra hydration, so the only the flocculation effect in the cement or in the concrete, and with hydration? Is there any way to separate these two, to the more physical, the more chemical developments that are going on in the material? Yep. Um, thank you for the question, Irina. Um, if, you if you can, you can go to slide 34. So this is where this is dealing with the subject. Um, and the answer is, um, on the technical ground, uh, we do um, small amplitudes um, oscillation, oscillatory strain. So basically probing the stiffness increase of the material non-destructively mm -hmm. by plate-plate uh, rheometry. And what we do in the first case without hydration is to strongly retard the cement hydration uh, so that basically hy the hydration is um, the hydration is not taking place. And the, in the other case, uh, we let uh, hydration occur. Okay, and, and um, another question we got on the same test is um, uh, De Braderisom is asking if this penetrometer test can be an easy replacement for yield stress measurements in a rheometer. Um, the the difference the target of the penetration test is really ease of use, because if you want to do st static yield stress measurements in a rheometer, uh, the way to do it is with a vein test, mm -hmm. and that means placing the sample in advance, letting it rest until you want to do the measurement. And that means that you usually only get one measurement point every time that uh, you are uh, mixing a material. Okay, thank you. So we're almost uh, through our time and uh, almost time to go to the break. Maybe one final question um, from Kees Lehmeyer is asking, how do long do you think it will take for a thin shell formwork in combination with set on demand concrete to be environmentally competitive? Um, so the high early strength or set on demand concrete versus low strength development of concrete with less environmental impact. So comment you can make on that? So um, clearly that is a, an area where we have to go and do a careful uh, life cycle analysis. However, 
um, there are a number of cases that we are working on with really very um, efficient um, formwork systems. And uh, that is essentially working. I think then ultimately the question is, what is your reference benchmark? Uh, clearly, um, if you just try to beat a standard wall, uh, that's not necessarily going to be the best thing. But as soon as it's some degree of complexity, uh, folded structures, curved structures come into play, there I think that very quickly uh, at least some of the digital casting solutions will uh, become competitive. Some of them um, are more ended, are more oriented towards the high end and others towards uh, more simple shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it depends what you want to, to produce. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Robert and Lex for this uh, Okay, opening keynote. It is all we have time for. I see there are a couple of more questions in the chat. Maybe you can answer them over the chat or in the breakout session or meet up with the uh, participants in the conference. But I thank you very much for your contribution. Um, we are now going to have a little break. Uh, to the audience, I would say please uh, take the time to have a look around in the online conference environment to check out the download links, check out the links of the pre-recorded videos, um, and perhaps also use the breakout rooms for some discussion. Uh, we will continue at uh, 1320 uh, Central European time, and I hope to see you there. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to organizers of Digital Concrete 2020 for making this event to happen in these challenging times. I appreciate the opportunity to be invited to speak here. I make this presentation 3D printing of concrete beyond horizons on behalf of all the authors of this paper, including myself, Dr. Florence Sanchez of uh, Vanderbilt University and Dr. Hong Yu Zhu of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Three D printing is a disruptive technology that can have enormous social and economic impacts in years to come. The technology which took shape in 1980s and was initially limited to manufacturing small products is moving to large scale construction applications, utilizing concrete and other cementitious and binder materials. This paper presents uh, a state of the art and a state of the practice of 3D printing of concrete, including a historical background and advances in equipment, materials, and computer modeling. Some demonstration projects are presented and opportunities and challenges associated with 3D printing of concrete are, are, are identified. My presentation is outlined here on this screen. The genesis and origins of 3D printing and construction are in automated and robotic construction, which are not new to the construction industry. A mobile or stationary system consisting of several robotic subsystems or components is a 3D printer. And the construction materials, which could be concrete, mortar, asphalt, polymers, they serve as the ink of the printer. On a desktop printer, a digital image is sent to the printer through a computer to be printed on a piece of paper. Similarly, in construction, the intent is to send a digital model to the printer to create a facility at above or below ground surface. Here is the definition, definition of uh, 3D printing I have come up with. Now let's have a look uh, what we already knew about 3D printing and what's uh, new. 3D printing and additive manufacturing are synonymous. 3D printing is an automated process of layer by layer creation of a product. Construction in buildings, bridges, highways, runways, marine structures, or almost any other facility has traditionally been an additive or layered manufacturing process, unlike other industries. The only difference is that this additive or layered manufacturing in construction has traditionally been manual and extre extre extremely labor intensive and uses form work. Uh, both slip forming and short creating, these are century old technologies, but people rarely acknowledge that they are additive manufacturing or 3D printing. 
In slip form construction, the form work is mechanized to automatically move vertically or horizontally as the material is continuously deposited in layers. In short, creating the concrete is uh, conveyed to a nozzle through a hose and then applied to a surface under pneumatic pressure, layer by layer. The technology has uh, been extensively used in tunnels. Here are the things which uh, we already knew, and now I have listed a few things at the bottom of the screen which are new to 3D printing. These are 3D printer ink formulations, advanced 3D printers, advanced computer modeling and simulation, and uh, explore explorations. Construction automaton, uh, construction automation gained momentum in the middle of last century, 1950s. Uh, this is the time when modern day robotics emerged, 3D printing gained popularity in industries like biomedical and industrial manufacturing in 1980s and commercial 3D printers became available in these industries. Probably this was the time frame when people started thinking about 3D printing in construction. In uh, mid 1990s, uh, a technology called crafting emerged which was later patented. This is an extrusion based method and somewhat similar to short creating. The difference is that the extrusion in concrete crafting is a piston pump mechanism like a syringe rather than a spray at high exit velocity in short creating. During this same time period, another technology, selective aggregation, emerged, which is based on laying down a matrix of sand followed by selective deposition of cement on the sand matrix and then activating the cement binder using steam. Since then, a number of other techniques and te terminologies have emerged, but essentially they are a variation of contour crafting and selective aggregation. Uh, I have listed some uh, names here, uh, like uh, freeform construction or concrete printing. Okay, let's see where we are. It is about 25 years into the development of modern day 3D printing and construction. Developments have been made, but it's still there is a long way to go before facilities can be printed by pushing print button on a computer. For practical purposes, the 3D printing is still in the lab or factory and efforts are continuing to improve the existing construction 3D printers or develop new printers. Also, efforts are continuing to develop uh, new construction materials, which I refer in this presentation as ink for the 3D printers. Now, let's have a look uh, at uh, the advances we have made in uh, equipment. To date, both gantry style and robotic 3D printers have been successfully implemented both in research and real world applications. The advantage of gantry style printers is that they are uh, relatively easy to scale up in size where robotic arms typically have a fixed dimension. However, the speed and degree of freedom of a 6x6 robot allow many complex tasks we perform that otherwise may not be possible with a four axis gantry printer. Also the payload on a gantry style printer is generally higher than that on a robotic arm. This photograph shows the different type of printers. On the top, top left is a four axis gantry system. Top center is a robotic 3D printer and top Right is a selective aggregation printer. Bottom left uh, is uh, the automated construction of expeditionary structures, uh, ACS system, which was jointly developed by US Army Corps of Engineers and National Aeronautics and Space uh, Administration, NASA. The system has a mobile uh, robotic uh, gantry system and uh, an automated material delivery system, which is comprised of uh, dry goods delivery system and a liquid, good, uh, liquid goods delivery system. The system has been successfully deployed in the field in the construction of uh, barracks. Uh, bottom right uh, is a hanging cable controlled large scale deposition system using a construction crane. 
which is currently being developed by Oak Ridge National Lab in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Now let's have a look at the advances in uh, materials. The development of uh, cement-based printing inks that have suitable flowability, extrudability, buildability, and which can set rapidly enough to meet the 3D printing process requirements remains a significant challenge in the application of 3D printing in the construction industry, and currently is the subject of most active research. Rheological requirements for printable concrete change rapidly over the printing process timeline from the nozzle to the filament deposition, filament interface, and the buildup of the printed element. Uh, we have listed uh, here the area of active research and uh, many presentations that will follow in this conference would likely cover most of them. Now let's have a look at advances in computer modeling. Most, most research to date on 3D printing of cement-based materials is based on experimental investigations. Computational simulations of 3D printing process of uh, cement-based materials remains, uh, remains limited. Uh, computational mod modeling provides insight into the multiple multi-scale and multi-physics phenomena that lead to the final material properties. Different uh, approaches for uh, computational modeling are uh, listed uh, here on the screen. In uh, physics-driven modeling, uh, different approaches uh, are used to simulate the behavior of fresh concrete flow and include uh, computational uh, fluid dynamics, CFD, discrete uh, element method D, and particle uh, method, and uh, multi-phase uh, suspension uh, method. In the other uh, modeling uh, methodology, topology, and microstructural uh, optimization, it consists of uh, disk discretization of an object or a structure into small elements and optimization of the material composition, volume fractions and spatial distribution within each element to achieve a structure with desired properties and functional performance. In materials modeling, molecular modeling and computer-aided molecular design are being used to understand the relationship between the molecular structure and the mechanical and physical chemical properties from this, one can design materials from the molecular scale at a fundamental level. Data-driven machine learning models are being used. Now, computation modeling is being extended into the modeling of 3D printed structural components, two failure mechanisms, uh, elastic buckling and uh, plastic collapse are being considered in these uh, analytical models. Looking at some uh, demonstration projects, a demonstration project by Oak Ridge National Lab well depicts the current state uh, of the art of 3D printing and uh, construction. A small house has been 3D printed using uh, 3D printed panels of uh, poly polymeric materials, and the house is uh, remotely connected to a 3D printed vehicle. And both the house and uh, vehicle power each other. And again, all these things uh, are the creation in the lab, uh, not, not in the field. We can say that we have developed the proof of concept and we need to scale up. This is uh, another uh, demonstration uh, project where uh, a green wall system has been developed with the modular elements that can serve both as load-bearing structural elements and uh, aesthetic elements for uh, growing greenery. And this building is a steel frame building, and uh, uh, these uh, walls uh, are the enclosure of uh, the building. Now, looking at this uh, photograph, uh, the demonstration of 3D printing and construction is slowly moving beyond the uh, lab. In uh, December 2018, the U.S. Marine Corps uh, 3D printed a pedestrian bridge in California. The bridge was 3D printed component by component, and then all the components were assembled together. 
Okay, challenges and opportunities. Construction industry is a heavily regulated industry due to the safety of the general public. There is a lack of uh, design rules and guidelines, which is uh, understandable considering the emerging nature of the technology. Just sheer size of the constructed facilities, difficult topography and trains and development and availability of large 3D printers are major challenges. Development of suitable ink formulations along with incorporation reinforcing is really certainly challenging, certainly a challenge as uh, noted earlier. Uh, the current code of practice is based on a composite concrete steel system and will remain so until the new material can offer the same balancing attributes of compressive strength and tensile strength. All these challenges represent their own set of opportunities. Now looking at the social and uh, economic uh, impacts of 3D printing. 3D printing in simple terms means more machine and less human involvement and the capability of the consumer to create products in a configuration and at a time and place of their own choosing. The balance of the movement and consumption of ingredient materials versus finished products will be disrupted. Portland cement, aggregate, and conventional reinforcing steel are the three primary concrete making materials which account for bulk of the construction cost. With the advances made in the formulation of ink for 3D printing, the use of these materials may be minimized or completely eliminated and replaced by other materials. For example, NASA is exploring the use of in situ materials as aggregate and binder to 3D print facilities on Moon and Mars. 3D printing can eliminate most of the cost associated with freight movement in a traditional supply chain, which includes the supplier, manufacturer, retailer, and consumer. And uh, this cost saving could be as much as 50 to 90%. And uh, 3D printing would have uh, impact on uh, across uh, board trade, uh, which would be diminished significantly. And this would have both uh, uh, positive and negative impacts. Now the path forward. The path forward for 3D printing and construction is bright and we can look beyond horizons on uh, what transformational changes this technology can bring. Any challenges can be overcome collaboratively by involving and engaging all disciplines and bringing together concerned public and private institutions, including academia and research. This event is one of the important ones which is bringing people together. I have listed uh, here specific uh, action items for moving forward. In this list of specific action items, I believe it is important that we develop uh, academic curriculum at universities for 3D printing and construction that combines all the needed knowledge and skills, including materials, structures, robotics, and computer software and hardware. To conclude this presentation, I would say that we are at a stage where we can digitally transform a model into a constructed facility on a limited scale or on a component level, primarily in a lab or factory setting. I can also say this, that from the advances this technology has made and the potential it exhibits, it is possible that by the middle of this century, we can 3D print at least some facilities in situ in a matter of hours or days by pressing print button on a computer. Well, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Hello, my name is Richard Buswell and I'm a Professor of Building Systems Engineering at Loughborough University in the UK. I'm presenting a process classification framework for digital fabrication with concrete on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Wilson Lille de Silva from DTI Denmark, uh, Freak Boss from TU Eindhoven, Rolf Schipper from TU Delft, uh, both in the Netherlands, uh, Dirk Loki, Norman Hack and Harold Kloft from TU Braunschweig and Victor Mecha-Turen to you Dresden again in Germany
uh, Tim Wagner from ETH Zurich in Switzerland and Nicolas Rousseau from Gustav Eiffel University, Paris in France. And the work is an international collaboration um, enabled through the Rylan Technical Committee on Digital Fabrication with Cement-Based Materials, TC276, which ran from 2016 to this year, 2020. During the development of the state of the art report in TC276, uh, it became apparent that we, the community, lacked an agreed common language and approach for defining and describing uh, the processes that we were looking at in DFC. Um, and a subset of the committee subsequently led the development of the work presented in this paper, which attempts to bring together manufacturing and construction in a coherent way to address this issue. Um, the work was subject to many hours of debate at committee meetings and was also exposed to wider audiences through two workshop and seminar events in order to inform its development. Now, we hope that it will help underpin the development of a common language um, and approach to process description uh, and so improve the communication in the R&D community uh, to take the first steps towards standardisation. Uh, to this end, the paper is open access and a freely available to download. So why is a classification framework needed now? Well, digitally enabled design and fabrication of concrete has been under development for some 50 years and the design of the Sydney Opera House by John Utsan and Obarrett began in 1957. There were 12 uh, design iterations over six years and computers were employed for the first time to carry out structural calculations. Now each computation required about 12 to 14 hours of computer time and weeks of preparation, but it shaved an estimated 10 years off the design time. The 1780s uh, brought robotics and automation into the construction industry, led by Japan through significant investment from the, uh, in R&D from the construction industry itself. And the drivers were the same then as they are today taking hand operations away from the construction site and enabling automation to unlock the productivity gains that leads to a reduced time on site and hence cost savings. And the 90s saw the use of digital fabrication tools, shape capture modeling, CNC manufacture to realize new and exciting building forms. And the example here, um, is Geary Zolhoff Towers, which used digital methods to manufacture 355 different panels and enabled just-in-time deliveries and the coordination of manufacture and construction. It was one of, if not the first example, of integrating CNC mill moulds into a formwork system for construction. Acknowledging the seminal work of Joe Pena in 1997, 2000s saw the first of the large-scale additive manufacturing processes for construction. And the first to emerge were contour crafting for in-situ wall uh, manufacturing uh, that at the time used actually a permanent formwork approach where um, the formwork was printed and then backfilled with uh, uh, a concrete material. Um, D-Shape was a large-scale 3D printer um, that uses, used then a sand and, and an organic binder to, to make freeform objects. And 3D concrete printing was based on the extrusion of a concrete filament um, employed to manufacture parts that were as good as cast concrete material. And now there is a huge number of methods and processes and products. Uh, the maturity and robustness of these varies um, from those entering the field to some of the more mature commercial processes. But design freedom is the value added by uh, DFC, but it's constrained by the material properties and the control that the process affords. And so processes are often developed um, for the production of product families, or at least different products that can be manufactured with the same process constraints. Now, if we want to begin to compare the relative merits of methods under some degree of control or bring together the findings from independent studies, we must ensure that the processes and the materials deployed in a technology are comparable. And we can only do this effectively through a common language. Some examples of uncertainty. So here are two processes used to create a 
column structures. Both use extrusion, uh, but the systems and materials are different. One uses a very stiff mortar, capable of withstanding significant self-weight as the layers are stacked up, and the other pumps a thinner mix uh, to the nozzle and then accelerates it at the point of extrusion. Now the differences affect the mix design, the auxiliary equipment and the control needed for the process. It affects the chemistry of the process and the geometry of the parts that can be manufactured. And it will affect the quality control procedures that underpin industrialization. And so processes are different and we need to be able to articulate these differences unambiguously. The example in this slide is mesh mould developed at ETH Zurich. And here a mesh is created such that the gaps allow concrete to flow through it but not out of it, um, then allowing troweling of the surface uh, to finish. The component is a freeform wall that uh, supports the DFAB house um, a temper. Now, are we making a 3D wall, uh, a 3D freeform wall in a clever new way? Or are we making a mould through automated assembly? Is it one process in all, or is it a series of process steps, for example, moulding, casting and troweling? We need to be able to recognise and define process boundaries. Now, the flexible mould approach depicted here operates on a series of pistons that provide freedom of curvature uh, of the casting surface, but it can be operated in more than one way to produce a panel. You can pre-shape the mould, uh, place on a flexible formwork uh, and then cast the part, or you can set up the flexible uh, formwork on a flatbed, cast the panel, and wait till it's in its plastic state and then deform the mould to the desired shape. Thus the mechanisms by which the curvature in the concrete is formed varies. The former is cast and the latter is deformed uh, and these differences will lead to variations in the process and the material. So specific instances of product need to be need to feature in descriptions uh, to ensure that differences are captured, particularly at low volume production. Now, have we done this before? Have we looked at this before? Well, um, we tend to use classification to help rationalise our views of complex spaces, and we do this routinely in our literature reviews uh, for papers and reports. But while there are frameworks in the literature, uh, they do not encompass the broad scope of the contemporary field of DFC. So let's take a look at a few DFC technologies. Um, Sprayed or shockcrete 3D printing was an application of sprayed concrete to produce a reinforced uh, curved uh, concrete panel. Uh, the Loughborough uh, double curved panels uh, were uh, hollow and they were printed using uh, extrusion and a temporary support system. The production of the post uh, tension bridge segments um, at TU Eindhoven uh, that contained a reinforcement wire in the extrusion. The Shuashang tender uh, used an approach that with conventional concrete and a very special deposition nozzle that placed concrete around pre-placed reinforcement. Uh, SDC here, or smart dynamic casting, is a sort of continuous micro slip forming approach uh, for the manufacture of columns and beams. And D-shape um, is a large uh, scale 3D printing method, as we've mentioned. And the example from Apiscore here, uh, they use extruded mortar in the construction of uh, walls. And in this example, uh, they've used the extrusion to create a permanent formwork that is then uh, used for casting conventional concrete. And the flexible mould and mesh mould approach um, I described earlier. So how might we go about classifying these? Well, by application uh, environment is one. So is it an on-site in-situ placement of material, uh, typically uh, the walls for buildings, or is it an off-site factory-based process for part manufacture, one-off parts or parts that form an assembly? And this is fairly straightforward in most cases. But how do we actually arrive at the functional part or element? Does the, pro does the process produce 
end-use parts or formwork. I'm happy this is clear-cut for some processes, um, but do the technologies of flexible mould and mesh mould produce panels and walls, or do they produce formwork? And it's not uncommon for us to split digital fabrication methods between additive methods and everything else. But would we um, classify smart dynamic casting as an additive method or something else? So gaining a clear picture uh, of what the process is doing and how it is interacting with the material is key to, clear to, uh, is key to understanding the similarities and differences um, in both the chemistry and the physics of the DFC processes. And if we turn to manufacturing, typical classification of methods includes process operations um, that identify the way in which the material of a part being manufactured is shaped, typically by the use of a mould or forming tool or by the removal of material from a solid block. Um, and assembly operations, where parts that have been shaped are then joined together. Uh, and these include welding, bonding and fastening methods. Now, additive manufacturing is another material shaping option, but here the shape of the final part is built up through discrete deposition of material in a layer-wise fashion, rather than the shape prescribed by a mould or a forming tool. Given the foregoing, um, we propose a classification framework for DFC should uh, be based on existing frameworks and standards. We shouldn't in reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. Um, it should be based on material shaping and assembly processes. We should endeavour to create a system that encompasses all DFC processes, and we should um, acknowledge the difference between in situ placement and factory production methods. So four characteristics are important when defining and, and describing DFC processes. Materials, the mixed design, constituents, grading, the use of admixtures, control of hydration, control of rheology, etc. Um, application, is it on or off site? Is it manufacturing or construction? Is it part of an assembly? Is it a one-off, etc. Uh, the product, what it is, what's its purpose, its specification? Is it an end use part or um, is it, uh, does it form a, a formwork? Um, the process, specifying the boundaries, uh, implementing implementation and sequencing of all of the operations uh, within the technology. Now we have called these the map characteristics for materials, application, product and process. And these should be described using the best practice in each instance of manufacture when reporting. The classification framework is represented here. It's been redrawn from the paper in order to fit the uh, presentation format. Uh, the technology should be specified in the context of the application environment and product it is being used to manufacture. And well-defined process boundaries allow the classification by operation, either by an assembly or a process. Material shaping options um, are additive, formative and subtractive, and then the relevant sub-processes within those classes are presented. Now we would note that while forming uh, the process subclass for additive methods, we adopted to the term uh, particle bed binding over the more conventional binder jetting, uh, which after much debate it was felt um, more reflective of the processes used in DFC. And the grey box um, in the uh, diagram simply highlights where we find the majority of DFC processes, but this is not meant to be exclusive in any way. So what happens when there appears to be more than one process um, given in a given technology? Well, one of three things. Where there are clear steps to take the stock material, the mortar or the concrete, to the finished product and make sure that the definition of the product and hence the process boundaries are not conflated, which is a common error. For example, um, considering that the finished wall is the product of mesh mould, rather than defining mesh mould as a step in the production process of a freeform wall structure that creates the mould. 
Now, the definition of hybrid processes is used in the wider uh, manufacturing uh, sector. And it's used to differentiate those cases where more than one process have been intentionally brought together under CNC control in a single machine uh, for benefit. Um, and we should endeavour not to use this as a catch-all term, as it will be unhelpful in many cases. For example, defining mesh mould as a hybrid process for producing freeform walls. Now, where the process is indispensable to the operation of the shaping process, um, they are not considered to be a step in the manufacturing process and so don't affect the classification. Um, they'd be called a sub-process where the controlling the acceleration of the printed mortar in an additive uh, manufacturing method would be a common example in DFC. So sub-processes are important um, in process performance assessment and comparison because they often differentiate otherwise similar methods as our 3D printed uh, column example earlier. Um, these processes might operate in series, simultaneously or contiguously with the material shaping process. And in this slide, the examples from left to right are the flexible mould, uh, which moulds, casts, deforms in series, uh, the reinforcement wire and um, entrainment through uh, an extrusion filament, which is a simultaneous operation, uh, and alternating between the build and support material within each layer um, would be an example of a contiguous process. So let's compare processes implementation sequencing using some simple diagrams. Now under these photos um, is a process cycle illustration. Uh, the bottom axis is time, uh, the square block represents the material shaping process and the circle represents uh, the sub-processes. Um, using these as a tool to describe the operation of the technology in combination with the knowledge of the material and the product is a powerful tool to um, identify the differences that might otherwise not be apparent. So the D-shape process um, is a method for producing free-form parts in a manufacturing setting and the technology is additive manufacturing process based on particle bed binding. Uh, and in the second example, the doubly curved panels, um, this was 3D printing, was a method for producing panel structures as discrete parts in a manufacturing setting. Um, and the technology is defined by the contiguous operation of a layerwise additive manufacture based on extrusion uh, and um, a temporary support material. Now these have uh, similar layerwise operations and these are indicated on the diagrams by the repeating blocks of which there's just two here uh, between the vertical dashed lines. Um, but the selectivity that enables the material shaping is different. Um, D-shape uses the location of uh, a bi uh, the binder where it adds the binder and the sub-process in this is the layering of the actual material, the build material in the first place. Um, the selectivity of the, the Loughborough process comes from the positioning of the material um, and the printing of the support material is the sub-process. The materials in both processes are also different. Taking the uh, Loughborough 3D printing method um, and comparing it to the TUE approach for creating the footbridge segments, the TUE method um, was used for producing parts from a composite material in a manufacturing setting and the technology is defined by continuous operation of a layer-wise additive manufacture material by extrusion with the simultaneous entrainment of a steel wire with the extrusion um, and it was arranged so that the part could be printed from start to finish without stopping the extrusion. So both of these methods uh, employ extrusion but the Loughborough method uses a support system and the TUF method doesn't. And the geometry of the components that can be produced by each are going to be different as are the hardened properties of the material. Now, one is not necessarily better than the other, but rather they've been optimized to overcome different engineering problems. And these have led to variations in the process configuration. And for two uh, non-additive methods then, smart dynamic casting uh, is a method for producing column structures um, as parts from a composite material in a manufacturing setting. Uh, the technology is defined by the continuous operation of the material extrusion over the length of the part. 
Now the extrusion in SDC, the process appears to be quite similar in the continuous nature um, of the previous Eindhoven example, um, but the difference is that the part is defined um, by the extrusion former in smart dynamic casting, whereas in additive processes, it's the placement or solidification of discrete volumes of material that actually define the final shape. Now, once defined as a method for uh, producing the mould for creating wall structures in situ, um, uh, as a method for automating construction operations, mesh mould uh, is unambiguously defined um, as an assembly process comprising of repeating, cutting, bending and welding operations. Now, other examples um, are illustrated in the paper, but the message here is that what we need to consider uh, the classification framework, the map characteristics, and the nature of the processes and sub-processes to identify similarities and difference in DFC technologies. And as we explore the potential of digital manufacture, we will increasingly um, adapt processes to overcome new challenges. Uh, and we should be ready and able to communicate these in a common language to help accelerate the development of DFC. Key to this will be adopting common practice in our publications, reports and presentations. And we hope that this presentation in conjunction with the paper is a helpful step in this direction. Uh, we've demonstrated that by careful consideration of the, uh, the process boundaries, it's possible to identify process steps in a technology uh, and that this simplifies the classification of methods. We presented a classification framework based on existing approaches and attempted to bridge the gap that exists between manufacturing and construction, and in particular, argue for the adoption of manufacturing uh, viewpoints as many of these pre-exist in automation and digital manufacturing. We identified four uh, contexts important to the technology's description, and these were the materials, the application, the product, and the process, or MAP for short. And we hope that this work will be a stepping stone to underpin an inter-process comparison and standardization in the future. Now, finally, I would like to acknowledge the many funding bodies and initiatives that have enabled this work to be undertaken and the members of TC276 for their input. I'd also like to mention the new uh, STAR report coming out of TC276, one chapter of which um, picks up the work reported here and showcases a number of case studies using DFC, which I'm sure will be of interest. Now, the DOI uh, to the paper um, is given on this slide for reference. It is open access, so freely downloadable. And on behalf of myself and my co-authors, many thanks for taking the time to view this presentation. Welcome back on the main stage where we have arrived at a rather peculiar section of the program, which is called Science Meets Industry. This is actually a small series, so to call it, where we as the academic world will visit the industry to see what they have been up to and how they have implemented the technologies that we've developed. First on the line is the Vergaderfabriek in Teugen, which is presented by Marijn Bruus. Enjoy. Welcome at Eindhoven University of Technology. Normally this campus would be crowded with 15,000 students, but due to COVID-19, unfortunately, it's empty. And it's the reason that we cannot meet in person here at our campus, which is a pity, of course. At Eindhoven University of Technology, we develop new knowledge related to the issue matter of digital concrete. Sometimes in isolation for fundamental research, but in this Brainport region of Eindhoven, most of the time in close collaboration with our industrial partners. Eventually, all the knowledge that we develop should end up with the industry for reasons of construction productivity, more sustainability, and a larger degree of freedom in architectural design. Today, we're going to visit a unique project in the eastern part of the Netherlands. Right now, we're in Teugen, near the small airport of Teugen 
Her local business owners Arvid and Mario wanted a small, circular meeting room. One of the requirements of the client was that it should be possible to project images and videos on each wall surrounding the meeting room to change the mood of the meeting room. My name is Marijn Bruus. I'm working at Witteveen & Bos, a large design and engineering consultancy in the Netherlands. We are with around 1300 people uh, globally in offices all around the world. We work on different types of projects, coastal defense projects, port projects, infrastructure projects, but also in the built environment, in which we're also involved in 3D concrete printing. We've been involved in many 3D concrete printing projects around the world, and one of which is the RN Drone Laboratory in Dubai, and we operate the largest gantry printer in Southeast Asia with our team in Singapore. Other projects we've been working on include uh, bridges in uh, Geemert and in Nijmegen and soon to be built bridges in uh, North Holland. We got into digital concrete because we need to increase the productivity of the construction industry. There are still too many people needed to build infrastructure, to build buildings around the world and those people are not available anymore and don't want to work in construction anymore. That's why we need to make it more appealing for young people like me to work in construction. The second reason is sustainability. The construction industry is responsible for around 40% of CO2 emissions around the world. With digital concrete, we can use smarter materials and we can use less material. In 2016, Arvid and Mario challenged the construction industry to come up with innovative ways to construct their dream. Multiple companies took on this challenge to create this special building. We started the collaboration with the contractor Witteveen & Bos for the design and the engineering and Hugo de Jager of Revelating to be the project manager. Together we took on the challenge to 3D print the first load-bearing, approved 3D concrete printed structure in the world. Architect Pim van Wielik of the Form Foundation designed this meeting room in such a way that from the sky it looks like a vortex created by an airplane. This is why all the walls in this meeting room are double curved. With the freedom of shape that 3D concrete printing offers, the architect started designing. But soon we realized that there were not unlimited possibilities in the design of 3D concrete printed buildings. So we needed to change the design to make it printable and make it work structurally. So we had multiple sessions with the 3D printing company, with us as the structural designers and the architect to create something which is both unique, feasible and structurally sound. The foundation of the building is a hectare flooring, which is ideal for thermal insulation. On top of the hectare foundation, we started printing walls. These walls were printed on site in a big tent to prevent the influence of the climate on the printing process. Each wall consists out of four layers of printed concrete. Three layers form an inner part, which is the structural part, and then there's an outer shelf on the outside, creating some visual effect on the outside. The outer leaf of the wall is connected to the structural part of the wall by wall ties, which were specially designed and tested for this project. Printing one wall element of about three meter in width took around two hours. When the printing was completed, the lower 30 centimeter of each wall was filled with cast in situ concrete to create a connection between the foundation slab and the wall. On top of the beam connecting the wall element to the foundation, biofoam was injected into the walls to create a thermal insulation. Biofoam is a biodegradable insulation material which can be reused when the building is demolished. On top of this biofoam a concrete beam on top was caused to create a connection to the timber roof structure. When we started with this project in 2016, 
There was only one commercial 3D printer available in the Netherlands that could print on site. This printer consists out of an ABB robotic arm, which is placed onto a mobile platform. Because of this platform, the printer is able to move around the construction site. It cannot move around the construction site and print at the same time, so each wall had to be divided into different wall elements which the printer could reach from a static position. The advantage of this printing system is that it can be used on-site and when it's on-site it's easy to maneuver around the building site. The disadvantage of this type of 3D concrete printer is that moving it around the construction site takes quite a lot of time. For example here in Teugen, printing one wall element takes around two hours but moving the printer from one place to the other place takes around six hours, including, of course, calibration of the robot. Besides 3D concrete printing, we also used other digital technologies for this project. The shape of this project is so complicated that it cannot be drawn into a simple 2D model, which is why we needed to create a parametric 3D model of the entire building to understand its complexity and to understand the shape of the building. Besides the parametric modeling, we also used finite element software to analyze the structural behavior of the building and to understand the flow of forces during the test. In order to obtain a building permit, we had to go through a process of design by testing because there's no Euro codes for 3D concrete printing. What we did was we printed one wall element on a one-to-one -one scale in the factory, which was tested until it failed. Eventually, we did not get up to failure because the testing facility could not reach the ultimate failure load. By using design by testing with one-to-one -one lab tests together with advanced finite element modeling, we were able to convince the local government to give a permit for this building in which it is allowed to use the 3D concrete printed walls as load-bearing structural walls. We tested the wall both for the vertical loading as well as the horizontal loading caused by the wind. By pushing the walls towards the inside but also to the outside in multiple cycles to see if it would fail. Design by testing is of course a lot of fun as a structural engineer, but looking towards the future of 3D printing and construction, we should not use design by testing with big one-to-one -one lab tests for each project. We should look around the world to see which tests have already been performed, which tests were successful and can be, can be implemented into your own project. Because it's the first time we've 3D printed a concrete building in which the 3D printed concrete is also used structurally, we of course have to check the long-term behavior of the material in time. At this moment, we're only observing small shrinkage cracks in the finishing of the wall elements, which is not disturbing for us as structural engineers. One of the things we've learned in this project is that the 3D printed mortar, which we have used for this project, reacts with the cast in situ concrete, which create a dark brown finish on the outside of the printed walls, which was not intended in the design. Another thing we learned was that it's difficult to print with a fast hardening mortar outside, which created cracks during printing in some of the wall elements, which then had to be redone. Another learning point in this project was that with 3D concrete printing, it's important to have a digital workflow. In this project, the designers, the architects, the engineers worked in a parametric model and the contractor worked in another model, which created some slight changes in the as-built model compared to the design model. The future of 3D concrete printing is the future of digital construction which means we need to increase the productivity on the construction site and we need to work on the sustainability of construction. Working on the productivity of 3D concrete printing means that it should be easier to operate printers on site and the printers that are available should be more robust. Working on the sustainability means foremost working on the material. The materials that we use nowadays for 3D concrete printing contain a lot of Portland cement, which ruins the sustainability of most 3D concrete printed projects. 
My question to you, scientists and researchers from all over the world, would be to develop a more sustainable material for printing. As structural engineers, we can reduce with 3D concrete printing the material we use in projects by over 70%, but if we still print with Portland cement, we will never meet our sustainability goals. So please work on more sustainable, printable mixtures. 3D concrete printing is only one step in the construction process. We need the robot to take over the site, and we need you to put the robot to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So getting a proper uh, manufacturing process for reinforcement, I'll just leave with those words. Okay, thank you. So, so it's not really about the reinforcement itself, but rather how to get it into the concrete in a, in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe Ru can add something to that because I've understood that he also joined this session. Yeah, uh, you know, what struck me was that um, regardless the method and the material used for reinforcement, in many cases it was not very it was not possible to use the full material strength due to lack of bond. And that is interesting because if you compare that to traditionally reinforced concrete, by now we sort of know how that works. Uh, for every type of uh, rebar, each diameter, each concrete grade, each steel grade. So we can all find that in the tables from the Euro code and or other codes. But you can see now that for 3D concrete printing, we are still at the very beginning of finding out how that works with bond because we have, we have completely new reinforcement materials. We have a new uh, fluidity of the concrete that is used also quite different uh, grain sizes, so, so aggregate sizes. So yeah, we are still starting to, to learn more about that. And what was also interesting is that uh, yeah, people rely on very uh, advanced methods for finding out how that works with the bond, such as uh, CT scans. And we've seen uh, impressive uh, videos of that as well. So that was uh, very interesting. And, and do you see already any uh, promising techniques that may solve these problems? Because I only hear the, the negative aspects. Well, we see that uh, we now are better capable of uh, reaching a ductile concrete. Uh, so various experiments have shown that uh, they were able to produce uh, a ductile concrete with strain hardening uh, qualities. So that means that we are able to produce a type of concrete that can at least uh, show when it's close to failure, which is a very important thing from a structural engineering point of view. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, un unfortunately, for for room B, we don't have any uh, anyone available for the uh, from the scientific committee that joined that room. Uh, so, but I do definitely recommend to check that out through the rewatching the presentation. Um, and there was a small mistake in room C, uh, so I'm, I'm directly going to move on to Wilson da Silva, who joined room D, which was on digital design technologies and industrialization. Can you give us any uh, a short summary of the things you've seen and the things that might be interesting for our audience? Um, Wilson, I think you're you're muted, or at least I cannot cannot hear you. Can at you moment. hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Clear. So yeah, good afternoon from Denmark to everyone uh, online now and who access this uh, stream later. Uh, the session was focused on digital design technologies and industrialization. And there was a really, the most interesting part to me is that most of the presenters were now trying to push extrusion-based printing methods mostly to a new level. And most of them were focusing on how to break from <clears throat> what you see on a, I mean, basically when you start working with 3D concrete printing, you're just printing some squared elements, you don't go to, uh, you don't challenge yourself too much into the, what kind of overhangs and inclinations and types of support material you, you can use. And on that, uh, in that uh, perspective, I have to highlight the presentation. The first one from uh, Ahmed is Sishan uh, Ahmed from T. Weinhoven. 
uh, who was using some lightweight uh, aggregates as means of using a support material to build in, in, you know, inclined structures. Uh, he also went through a process that I, I read a bit about, uh, but I was surprised also to see his presentation. Uh, it is a FRED system that the intention is to, in, you know, to inject uh, fibers during the extrusion process into 3D concrete prints. That was also quite interesting. Uh, in the in the second present, uh, sorry, not the second, but the third presentation from Ben Amara, that's uh, his surname. He was using a process where he used carbopolis, basically a liquid material as support, and he was using extrusion basis, based system inside this liquid material. I've seen that technology being used by a company uh, already, but it was nice to see the calculations and the, the way he was approaching the technology to make sure he, he the suspension can actually hold the material that that uh, he's extruding. So that was something that was something new to me. And then the close, the last presentation from Richard and and his uh, mates at uh, Loughborough University, and there was a collaboration in this case with Eindhoven, Brunswick, and and uh, another institute. Uh, it was heavily focused on inspection methods, just highlighting how important it is that that you actually have to do. A verification of your geometry after printing. You cannot just go print and, and expect that it will be exactly as you, you designed. Not at the moment, of course. So studies like that are, are also uh, uh, interesting to read about. So this is my, my overview. All right. Thank you for that. That's a very clear overview. Um, and, and of course, there's a lot still to come also on these topics specifically, as you can find in the program. Uh, it's, it's organized by topic and all of these topics will continue in the coming days. So if you hear some developments here, you can still join in on those. Um, for that, I would like to, to end the wrap-up session for now. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our members of the scientific committee for helping out here, uh, joining during the wrap-up and uh, informing the rest of the audience what was told. Um, and before we are going to go to close this live stream completely, I would like to say that the event that you're currently in will stay open until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, Central European time. Uh, at that time, the new event will open, which is the second link that you've received in your uh, email, and with that you can uh, join a similar environment as you've seen today, and uh, we will continue there at 12 a.m. Central European time. Um, that also means that since the event will stay open now, you can still use all the facilities that uh, are available here, like the breakout rooms, the one-on-one -on -one, um, chatting options. Uh, you can rewatch the presentations, and like I said, the proceedings are also available, so you can have a look at that as well. Uh, and of course, the poster presentations are also available there. And with that, I would like to end the live stream for now. I would like to thank you for all of your attention, the great numbers that we've seen, I think, up to 300 people are joining the live streams at any specific, specific time. And of course, we hope to see that uh, also during the coming days. And we hope to meet you all there. Thank you.
Welcome at Eindhoven University of Technology.